Welcome to the lecture on the environmental impacts of energy supply. Of course, we will talk about the climate impacts and we will link that topic to the question on how much fossil fuels we actually have and need. We will then continue with the land use issue of energy supply, move on to another particular impact, which is particulate matter, and finally have a quick outlook on the material use of energy infrastructure in general. Now, for the climate. There is roughly three major greenhouse gases that we need to control. That's carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. And this figure shows you how these three greenhouse gases are linked to the different end use activity. So that's the middle bar here. And then on the left side, how they are linked to the different sources. And the biggest source is, of course, the energy supply and of course, there the fossil fuels. Other major sources are land use change emissions and emissions from agriculture, from soil mostly. So you see that tackling climate change means tackling our energy system, supply and use. More in detail, we know that the different fossil fuels are the major contributor to those energy related carbon emissions. And we also know that's shown on the right side here that these energy use is concentrated in the different sectors, transport sector, industry, so producing things, making materials and the building sector. So all the sectors also have to contribute. And this is the big question of the energy transition of how this can happen. Here, we only want to show that it is really distributed across the different sectors, the allocation of emissions to the end use activity. We also know that there's hope. The hope lies on the low carbon renewable energies, especially solar wind and to some extent, because of limited potential, hydropower and biomass. They, on average, have much lower life cycle carbon emissions than their fossil competitors, especially coal based electricity, which is the most carbon intensive source on average that we have. So at the small scale, so per kilowatt hour per megawatt hour, renewable energy, low carbon energy works. The question is, of course, how we can scale up things. But this is not the topic of this lecture. Here, we just want to show that there's huge difference in terms of carbon intensity of different energy conversion devices, and that there is potential for a low carbon energy transition. Same plot from the IPCC and also shows the range of carbon emissions that we have. And that range has different reasons. For example, in bioenergy, we can, of course, have very different circumstances, different farming yields, different conversion routes, different land use calculations in there. We also have huge variations for the fossil fuels, depending on unintended emissions, for example, methane leaking from pipelines and so on from natural gas pipelines. All these things can happen and they create potentially large variations in the supply, in the carbon intensity. But the message is still the same. We have the low carbon options and we can save orders of magnitude of emission and still have the same amount of electricity that is then provided. We also have a particular challenge regarding the fossil fuels. 20 years ago, this lecture would have been very different. It would probably have been a lecture with a warning that the world may be running out of fossil fuels. Now it's actually the opposite for two reasons. The first reason is that over the last decades, we have made many discoveries, especially of coal, but also new oil fields and new natural gas deposits. There's a lot more stuff in the ground than we would have anticipated 20 years ago. The second reason is technology has advanced. The stuff that's in the ground, even subsea, can be produced. It can be taken out and supplied to our industry. So this means the overall available fossil fuels are much larger than we would have anticipated. And now comes the problem. The problem is climate change. We have all these fossil fuels. They are the main driver of climate change. We need to reduce emissions. So we need to reduce the use of fossil fuels. So the whole idea of do we run out of fossil fuels has actually switched from maybe we will and it will be catastrophic 20 years ago to 
we need to leave them in the ground. The best is to leave them where they are and not use them. That sounds much easier than it actually is because fossil fuels still have a good business case. For many countries, many companies, they are a stable and predictive source of revenue. And also we have the challenge that if the fossil fuels should be left in the ground, we have too much of them, it means that the prices will decrease, thus further promoting their use. So there is a tricky economic relation here as well. Another important research and also technology development question is how we can make low carbon electricity even more low carbon. What does that mean? It means that today, even though, for example, a solar cell has no emissions during the use phase, it still has a lot of emissions in the production stage. But what happens if we use low carbon electricity to produce low carbon materials to then produce solar cells. And if you have such a positive circle, a success spiral in the race towards zero carbon energy supply, we can actually reduce the carbon intensity of renewable energies even more because we produce low carbon energy conversion devices with low carbon energy. So here you see in this quite interesting study that for some of the renewable options like photovoltaics and wind, we can reach carbon intensities on average of below 10 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That is about 1% of lignite or brown coal based electricity. So we can cut out up to 99% of emissions of the today most carbon intense energy sources. That is a potentially really huge success story. And if we can do this at scale, it will also mean that we can use that really low carbon electricity to produce other fuels or materials that are today not possible because it's too expensive. For example, to produce hydrogen, low carbon hydrogen at the large scale to then power industrial plants or maybe produce liquid fuels for air travel and so on. So there is a lot of potential here for decarbonizing even further, but of course it requires a lot of investment and also some timeline to actually have enough renewable energy to decarbonize at large scale. So we talked about the scale issue already now of renewable energies in particular. And one problem that we do have for renewable energies is the land use problem. As soon as we scale up renewable energies, we will run into large land conflicts. And the reason is that for the renewable energies, we just need a lot of land. We have certain energy conversion efficiencies, like for example, we have roughly a half a watt per square meter over the annual average for bioenergy. It can be up to one and a half watt, but that's not much, right? We can have maybe 20 to 25 watts per square meter on average for solar power stations, but also that is not very much. So for large quantities of renewable energies, we need large land areas. So where will they come from? This is in many places unclear. We have land use conflicts. We have tight regulations that in many places already limit the expansion of renewable energies. We have also the conflict between bioenergy and food use and material use. So the issue of land is probably one of the most dominating ones for the energy transition towards renewable energy in the future and needs to be carefully managed. What science can do is to quantify typical and average land use of different energy conversion technologies. So here we see what is the land that we need to reserve to generate a certain amount of solar based electricity, coal based electricity and so on. And we see interestingly that coal based electricity still needs a lot of land. It's actually even higher than many solar installation and the reason is of course the mining of the coal that uses a lot of land here and if you factor that into the life cycle you see that also the land footprint here is quite large. Next to the land occupation of energy conversion assets there's also the question of land use change. So we know from previous slides that we have a certain land use 
of, for example, bioenergy production or wind energy. But also we need to raise the question of what happened to the land before we use it for harvesting energy. And this question becomes particularly relevant for biofuels. You see here in this graph the example of the carbon emissions of different liquid transportation fuels and it sticks out that for palm oil we have a a very high carbon impact higher than the fossil diesel and b most of that carbon impact comes from the green bar and this is land use change what does it mean it means that if we clear cut and destroy a pristine tropical forest to later farm oil there with oil palms we have a lot of carbon released to the atmosphere it's the carbon in the trees in the other biomass of the forest but it's also the carbon in the soil and especially in the peat in the soil underneath so in the worst case destroying such a forest and turning it into an economic asset for producing palm oil also destroys the carbon benefit of the actual oil farming totally we need to manage this we need to factor this in uh, and also we need to align this with assessment of biodiversity losses and of social conflicts but balance it of course against the possible economic gains that you can get from making land productive it is a very complex and tricky issue here we need to raise awareness of the topic that land use change emissions from soil decomposition and forest de rest composition can be very very high and actually lead to much higher life cycle emissions for biofuels than we see for fossil fuels another issue of energy supply is its strong linkage to air pollution because fossil fuel use means at some point we need to burn the fossil fuels that means we will have smoke and in that smoke we not only have co2 and water but we also have a lot of soot we have dust we have heavy metal particles and so on and overall this means that air pollution is actually causing premature deaths and it's estimated that we have on the planet annually more than 7 million premature deaths as a consequence of air pollution much of that is due to burning fossil fuels so there is potentially a really high co-benefit of the energy transition we could switch to cleaner energy sources and low carbon energy sources at the same time and this is illustrated in the plot here from the latest ipcc report that we can say the low carbon electricity options have significant co-benefits also across the heavy metal and particulate matter pollution so we see here the energy sources that score low are include the biofuels and that is a good message right so politicians who would like to tackle air pollution can so to say sneak in low carbon energy and have two goals with one measure becoming low carbon and fighting local air pollution here another visualization of the same indicator here it's measured in kilograms of particulate matter of 10 micrometer equivalents per megawatt hour of electricity generated and again you see a wide range but the renewable energies tend to score lower on that indicator than the coal technologies and especially also natural gas so that is reinforcing the good message here that we have a triple benefit right we have renewable we have low carbon and we have low air pollution it is often unclear which impacts matter most we can quantify a lot but a quantification by itself is not yet a decision we need to juxtapose the different indicators we can quantify the carbon impact the land impact particulate matter impact but also on the other side the potential benefits on the economic side the revenue generated the employment generated and then need to find a solution and this solution needs to involve many stakeholders and a political process so it's often not possible 
even though we have the co-benefits to always find a clear solution because there are many different impacts and many different interests to be considered. The only thing that we can do as scientists is to make sure that our numbers are right and that we don't enter numbers into the bay that are really not correct or that we suggest impacts like the ones illustrated here are actually relevant. So we can do our science right to really say what the actual impacts are and so we can make sure that we cut out the junk science but then the science that is left, the good science, still has a lot of complexity and still needs a complex decision-making process on top of that to then identify really which impacts matter most for society in a given situation to then arrive at a hopefully good decision. In the last section of this lecture I would highlight the energy material nexus and this is the link of energy conversion devices to material use. When I harvest energy I need some technology, I need some device and this is made up of materials and we observe that the modern energy technologies are more material intensive than what we had before and also the materials are becoming more specialized and more complex. One example is shown here and this is the amount of steel and copper that I need on average to deliver a certain amount of electricity and you can see that for both materials the increase from major fossil technology coal-fired power to renewables like wind turbines and photovoltaics is a lot. It's a factor of 3 to 10 so that means I need to invest a lot of more into material production and also have associated impacts to actually deliver a certain amount of electricity. This is a life cycle indicator meaning that I stretched over this material use over the entire life cycle of these installations. And it's not only the energy supply side that has this problem, it's also the energy conversion and demand side. Another example for copper here, a typical gasoline driven vehicle contains about 25 kilos of copper. This number will increase to around 100 kilo for a battery electric vehicle because has, this one has copper everywhere in the batteries, in the overall wiring of the vehicle and of course in the engines. And we need to understand how can we source those materials at a relatively low impact and in the future also how can we recycle them. So here we have a study by colleagues that is on China that we can say hey what is the impact of Chinese energy transition on the material demand. So we see which energy technologies in that given scenario here will actually contribute to demand for copper and for steel, iron steel in that particular example. Of course there will be increasing demand for many other materials as well including aluminium and we can quantify those and we, because we know roughly how material intensive these different technologies are. And when we do this for different sectors we realize that it's not only the bulk materials like aluminum, steel, concrete of which we will need more, it's also the specialty materials. So we can expect that the demand for example for semiconductor materials like gallium or for magnet materials like neodymium will multiply over the next years and that creates several problems. The first one is where will the material come from? Do we have enough resources? And even if we have, are they accessible? Is it possible to open mines in the places where we find those resources? And is it also politically stable to source materials from certain regions? The second major issue related to material supply is of course the different environmental impacts of material production. Many mining operations contain a lot of energy and water use so that means in remote areas we can expect huge impacts. We need basically to clear lots of land to get to the materials not only for the mines themselves but also for the related energy and water supply. So the material aspect of the energy transition is another challenge next to the land use challenge that we need to carefully monitor and also manage. With this remark I would like to close this lecture. Thank you.